to vote for big data. So in terms of exogenous to endogenous variables, the mapping is Q is sort of the, the a preference parameter. So which party has most supporters? This could be considered the, the, the polls. And uh, do you have a question? Massachusetts, it's not that Martha Coakley power shares. Right, so, and so in the United States, it's all, uh, um, it's all um, single member districts, and so it, yes. wouldn't, it wouldn't apply there in that sense. Right. Um, so, um, yeah, so looking at the preferences here, number of voters, and that's going to be the term in, determinant, and uh, alpha and beta is going to be what we want to find, okay? So we're going to just use um, a setup of Boston games which simplifies this analysis and, uh, and works for n large, and so all our assumptions are going to be of, for large elections, and so that, that's a technical assumption, it's maybe just substituting a binomial, trinomial distribution with Poisson, which is more readable. So, uh, so again, all these, uh, this, this, um, this situation is um, the equilibrium condition for both models, uh, the power sharing or the full uh, majority model, and uh, we just have, the only difference is going to be what this benefit is going to be, okay? And in one model, again, is the, the chance that I affect the election and then that I'm pivotal, and the other one is how much I affect the, the election every time knowing that I affect always, but just a little tiny bit above the line. So um, we're going to go through the majority model because it's um, because this, this heterogeneity of cost uh, generates some, uh, although this model is well known, it generates some results that uh, we didn't expect. Yes? Because the question of information, is Q the probability of turnout exogenous here? and just see what different values of Q are. So the turnout is uh, endogenous, and Q is exogenous. It's a preference uh, parameter. So it's, uh, it's like the ex-ante polls. 30% like party A, 70% like party B. And the Q is from that, you're going to get endogenous turnout. So you'll solve for whether an individual chooses to vote or not. Correct. Okay. Correct. And so turnout will depend on this Q will depend on an N, the size of the population, and will depend on the system we're looking at, either majority or power share. So it's three things. OK. So there was another question. Is there a technical point? Um, I'm not sure if your model happens, but I think of two ways of being close to the point at which it affects it. One is you know with almost certainty that 0.5 are going to vote one way and 0.5 are going to vote another way. Another is that your, you know, your, your estimate of how people are going to vote is 0.75 and 0.25, but you have a lot of noise around that. And I'm, it just wasn't clear to me how you're, how you're sort of capturing that in terms of the structure, physical structure. So in, um, in both cases, I'm going to have noise. And, uh, um, and so the answer is yes, in both cases I will have noise whether I'm at 50-50 or 25-75, which will mean uh, even if I'm at 25-75 in preferences, say, then there's a, but we'll have to see what the equilibrium is. It, it could be that uh, we get, instead of the actual outcome of the vote, it's not 25-75, but it's much closer to 50-50. We have to see what the, the equilibrium is. Right, and even in that equilibrium, it's a statistical statement. There it will be, it will, it will still talk about. It. There is never going to be certainty about what's going to happen. Otherwise, people would not vote because they would know. Yeah, yeah. right. right. Uh, this your, your model seems to be to be suggesting that you know, if I belong to a party, I never vote for the other party. That's the, right. The only question is whether I vote or not vote. That's right. That's the model. There's just two parties, so that wouldn't... But a, a Democrat would never vote for a Republican. That's right. That's right. Uh, that issue would come up with more parties. 
proposed strategically and not sincerely. It doesn't arise generally with two parties. Was this, yeah, oh, so I think Eddie's question may have been sort of about the, the Chamberlain Rothschild type setup versus uh, just the pure exogenous probability of landing with either faction type setup. Know, is that a possible reinterpretation of it where you know you don't know the proportion of the left right who is D's or R's? You know, it's close to 50, but this is a criticism that is, you know, has been levied of on other work in this thing. Um, that, you know, that's a different way of thinking, and they have different implications for thinking about the problem. I didn't know his name, but that's what I heard. Yeah. So what happens if you don't know Q? That was your question, right? Uh, we're going to see something about that later. We're assuming you know the the polls with a sufficient amount. That's right. Okay. So um, okay. So this is just. Uh, let me look at the benefit. So again, benefit equal cost. And here, what a, a voter is looking at is uh, okay. I'm, I I like party A. Should I vote or not? And uh, I just look at the, my expected chance that the election is going to be a tie and I make the difference. And this is given by, by this expression and we're used summing over all the possibilities essentially that the, the election ends up into a tie. Well, the chance of being perfect. Okay. Um, so, um, this is, um, give you some approximations here to find out and in the end, the result we get is um, is the following. Um, um, so there's a relationship between uh, um, the turnout of alpha for party A and the turnout for party B. And um, so the, the result is the following. So if uh, we have an exempt symmetric election, not surprisingly, uh, the turnout for each party is going to be the same if their costs are coming from the same distribution, of course. So that's uh, there's no asymmetry there, so it's symmetric from the beginning, and so it's symmetric exposed as well. And so this is um, ex exante even election ends up into an exante even uh, exposed even election. Okay. Uh, then we have suppose we have lost generality. Party A is the minority. What you have is that uh, the minority turns out in larger percentage than the majority. But uh, that's not enough to overcome the initial preference disadvantage. Okay, so is this uh, make sense? So if, uh, you may have a 30 versus 70 percent uh, preference exempted, and exposed what the vote turns out to be is instead of 30 70 maybe uh, 40 60. Okay, which means the minority turnout, and we call this partial uh, underdog compensation effect. It's partial and not full. Is this? Um, and then we have, uh, on the pencil of N, we have uh, what we call a size effect. So, of course, as the electorate becomes larger, the chance that you, um, that, that the chance that the election ends up in a tie drops. Okay? And um, the speed at which it drops is different whether the, the election is exactly a tie or not. Because uh, if the election is exempt a tie, then uh, um, there's a certain chance uh, that it will not be a tie that goes down like 1 over square root of n. If the election is not exempt a tie in the preferences, it could still end up in a tie. Okay, it's like throwing n biased coins. They're biased, they could still end up an equal number of heads and tails. But uh, that's a lower chance and it, it drops down a dramatically different rate. This is un unbiased. 